Welcome everybody to the final lesson of this unit um, where we actually will examine a few of the examples of how um, the human interaction with the ocean actually impacts the ocean. So up till now we've talked about it as a resource and how we benefit from the ocean but we have not really talked about how it impacts the ocean as an ecosystem, the chemistry, any of the physics and so on. Um, one of the most obvious ways that we that what we our interaction with the ocean impacts the ocean is in physical destruction. Um, so there are many examples of this and we'll just go over a couple here, one of which is dredging. And we talked about how we dredge the ocean, the bottom of the ocean, because we, we like to we collect the sands, we collect um, the sand, the silts, the, the, the stones um, for all different purposes. Um, but sometimes we're just clearing the sand and the silt and the stone out of the way because erosion and deposition has blocked a waterway that a boat needs to go through. And so the, 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 the side effects of this are you're destroying the, that benthic environment um, where those sands and silts and stones um, exist. And we know a lot about the benthic environment and the ecosystem there and what that entails now. Um, f from this course, but but also as you flush this stuff around, you cause a lot of silt and mud and dirt to stir up. You stir up the bottom, and not only does it go and deposit somewhere else unnaturally, but it also spreads throughout the water. Uh, the water column is a big plume, and that has a lot of um, deleterious effects. So you get a cloudy water, which will block out the sunlight for photosynthesis for benthic macro and microalgae but also for the phytoplankton in the in the in the um in the water column and so that interrupts the ecosystem and the food chain and, and its natural processes. But this resuspension of 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 sediments along the bottom, we know there's a lot of organic matter trapped in there, so a lot of organic matter can be resuspended up into the water column. The bacteria up here degrade the, the the organic matter and they use up the oxygen in the process because they're heterotrophic um, oxi oxygen using heterotrophs so they suck down the oxygen at alarming rates and that can also kill off a lot of the or make it inha inhabitable for inhabitable for um, other oxygen using species. Um, the other thing is you can have um, toxic chemicals either from natural processes or from deposition from humans um, that are laying pretty much in uh, um, not affecting the ecosystem because they're settled out in the sediments. But when we stir this up, they spread out through the environment. But you you erode you in unnaturally erode some parts of the sediment floor and and unnaturally deposit it in others, um, and so you can actually physically change the tidal range, how deep high and low tide go, which can affect essentially all the intertidal um, organisms that we spoke of before. And there's many other effects, and these are just a few. So another pretty destructive process is a fisheries method um, called trawling. Um, but we'll talk about that in more detail in the next unit when we go over fisheries. Um, but essentially, uh, all of our activities along the coast, um, we like to live on the coast, we like to work on the coast. Um, it is convenient for us to live and work on the coast. We have tra access to transportation, we have access to exports and imports, um, and so we have a lot of building and industry on the coasts, and all of those uh, entail a certain amount of physical destruction to the coast itself. But it also has the side effect of essentially introducing all kinds of marine pollutants. Um, and 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 where we are either introducing a substance or an energy or or disturbing or affecting essentially any kind any physical chemical or biological parameter um, process in in that local environment and then we have to start evaluating them as to whether or not these are fixable versus non-fixable problems can we clean up or fix that that impact or can we do it in a way that that, that it's not having this strong of an impact. Um, and then when we get to substances, um, essentially point source pollutants, we start to view them as biodegradable which versus biomagnification. And biodegradable is, is pretty self-explanatory. Um, so the, or if an organism is exposed to a substance, um, they can either degrade it directly into um, non-hazardous materials or if what they're consuming has that substance in it their body can degrade it and 
and and get rid of it at wa it was waste without too big of a cost. Biomagnification, on the other hand, means non-degradable, and it doesn't just mean they can't degrade it. It means it accumulates with time and has a direct um, impact on their on their physiology. Um, and some of the most more nasty chemicals um, in existence fall into this into this category. Um, chlorinated hydrocarbons is a big one. Um, heavy metals are really bad ones, uh, like mercury and cyanide. Uh, some of these are are products of 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 our technologies or of just industry and factory type work in general. DDT is a really important um, case study on insecticides. Um, this was really popular for getting rid of in insects, including mosquitoes and that kind of thing, in the early to mid 1900s, and 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 I think is pretty much outlawed everywhere now that we know the the, the, the deleterious effects of it. And these are all due to facticides, spreading of pesticides and fertilizers for houses and farms, etc. So let's stick with DDT for a minute just to see, get an example of what biomagnification really is. Um, so if you're at the lower portion of the food chain or of the trophic pyramid here, right, you're a phytoplankton, you're, you're a primary producer, and you take up inadvertently some of this, this, um, substance that's introduced into the environment, you can't break it down. It's now inside your cells and you pass it on um, to, you know, you, you either retain it or pass it on to your to your offspring. And then you're consumed by essentially the, the next trophic level up. So if one phytoplankton has 0.04 units of, of, of DDT in it and, and its consumer consumes one of these that it then has 0 .01, 0 0.04 units of DDT and then it consumes another plankton and it has 0 0.08 it consumes another one and it has 0 0.12 and so on and so forth and it's not really a linear late relationship like that it's not doesn't really add up quite directly like that but that's that's the overall idea it it bioaccumulates that's that's why we call it biomagnification and so now this trophic le so that means this trophic level essentially accumulates more of the of the poison of the of the um, pollution of the pollutant um, and then of course the next trophic level up consumes many of them which means they have a higher level of the pollutant and then it usually is worse uh, case scenario for the um, for the for the top predators of that food web, and especially especially the top predators like an os like an osprey or the 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 bald eagle, um, <clears throat> really took the brunt of this and 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 went on, essentially went on the endangered species list because DDT would weaken their eggs and poison their their um, their physiologies to to the point where they couldn't reproduce anymore. And essentially, most of this is introduced just by the collective activity of our use of the ocean as a resource. We get pollution from our traveling, using it for transportation and recreation. We get pollution from extracting our... Um, we get physical destruction from both of those, but also from extracting the resources. Um, we get pollution and destruction from, from living in and, and interacting with the coastal coastal area that's adjacent um, and and much of this is either physical damage or introduction of of um, a point source marine pollution um, biomagnifiable ones but even things like um, even things like waste from septic tanks fertilizers and pesticides from treating um, residential homes but also farms and they all wash in oil spills are a very obvious one um, <clears throat> usually a, a, a huge point source uh, marine pollutant and the real problem with 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 um, with oil spills is that they they pollute with at many different levels there's not just the oil slick in raw petroleum uh, that floats on top there are many different types of hydrocarbons in raw petroleum and and some of them dissolve into the water at, in varying degrees and so they get caught up they dissolve some of them set them at, set them out and affect the benthic environment but a lot of them dissolve and and either spread by wind or spread through currents and this is what a lot of people don't really understand about oil slicks um, but we also just dump our raw sewage and, and wastes directly into the ocean. Um, there are laws regulating how and where, and essentially if you're a coastal community or a city, 
you're allowed to dump your raw waste, essentially every time somebody flushes a toilet, out into the ocean as long as your pipe, your sewage pipe uh, goes so far out into the ocean and is in the correct placement from the current so that the sewage isn't blown back towards land. And then in terms of industrial waste, um, there are laws for that as well, where as long as you go to certain parts of the ocean or you're certain distances away from the, from the uh, coastline, then you can dump certain types of waste. And this is actually a sign from a research vessel, an ocean-going research vessel that I that I was um, that I was on not not too long ago, just this late spring. And this and they had this sign on, and you know uh, you're not allowed to dump anything until you hit about three miles. But then then it's only illegal to dump these these collection of things. Once you get between three and twelve miles away from the uh, the coast, it's <clears throat> it's still illegal to 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 dump dunnage linings and packing materials that float but this stuff now you can dump as long as it's ground to within one inch one inch pieces once you get beyond 12 miles um, it doesn't even matter if you grind it or anymore or not you can dump all this stuff but it's still legal to dump dunnage lining and plastic floating materials or packing materials that float in plastics and then once you get between beyond 25 miles it's only illegal to dump plastics so you can dump pretty much whatever you want once you get out there one of the biggest overall effects of this sort of mass introduction of human materials into the ocean is a process we call eutrophication. And this is where, the th the, the, whether it's a part of a mixture or a direct runoff of a certain substance, um, acts as a fertilizer for phytoplankton to grow unnatural, to unnatural levels. So as an example, if you are on a coast and you're near a farm or near just a large community that uses a lot of fertilizers and this gets into the river water and runoff water and runs off into the into the um, ocean if we have phosphorus and nitrogen that runs off it stimulates a huge phytoplankton bloom so the phytoplankton bloom becomes so large that it blocks out the sun and it blocks out all the organisms and all the ecosystem processes that need the sun that's first off um, down below a certain depth. As a matter of fact, not very deep at all does this occur. You also cause this mass amount of organic matter that begins raining down through the through the um, through the water column, and this can uh, cover up and 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 essentially um, suffocate the the benthic ecosystem that's below it. But also, as this organic matter sinks, um, the heterotrophic bacteria um, that use oxygen break down this organic matter at tremendous rates and they use up the oxygen so quickly that it makes the makes it difficult and inhabitable for any organism any other organisms that need oxygen to live down there and so if you have just small inputs of nutrients you have sort of a, a normal water column ecosystem and plenty of oxygen and nutrients down deep the way it should be but if you have this excess of nutrients, nitrogen or phosphorus that's caught up in runoff or anything else that's part of our waste, and our raw sewage alone has plenty of everything, um, then you get a, an overly large unnatural phytoplankton bloom in an area that's not re in an area or a time that's not ready to have it, and you get all the organic matter associated with that that run that 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 settles out of the water column, the organic matter gets broken down and all the oxygen gets sucked out. And we call that a dead zone. And the other the other effect is that it that it's so thick it blocks out the sun and so that nothing else no other processes below that that need the sun can go on there. Um, so the other thing to remember and we can think of this in terms of our, our conversation about fertilizing the southern ocean with with iron, it's one of the things we're worried about is if we fertilize a certain section that's not usually uh, used to this kind of growth, yes we may suck CO2 out of the atmosphere um, that we'd like to have gone, but also if we remember in our talk in diagenesis about bacterial um, metabolisms that don't require oxygen, right? So first thing that happens is the bacteria that use oxygen break down this organic matter, but when the oxygen's gone, the bacteria that don't need oxygen go to town on this organic matter, and the byproducts of their metabolism are things like nitrous oxide and methane, and these things would now be released as a byproduct and possibly out into the atmosphere, and these are many, many times stronger greenhouse gases than CO2, so we would actually end up having the opposite effect. 
So the other thing is, not only can eutrophication cause um, blooms of normal green phytoplankton that can have all those negative effects, but it can also cause blooms of, of, of uh, bad phytoplankton, which cause like red tides.